Hello, everyone. Hi, Hi Marcos. Good to see you again. Likewise, likewise. So um, we are continuing, or hopefully this week, finishing our little romp through the signs of yeah. the zodiac and their um, physiological meanings and some plants associated with them. And I think we left off last time with Sagittarius. So we're going to start today with Capricorn. I think we're going to start today with Capricorn. You're quite right. Um, so Capricorn. Um... Have you got your favourite Capricorn ha herb to hand? Yes, I I, I certainly do. Uh, that's, well, that's, um, you start it's, then. You well, start. it's it's actually it's one of Nicky Culpepper's um, ones. Mm -hmm. So he, I think, talks about he refers to the herb as Carduus, but he's oh, actually yeah. referring to what the plant we now know as Canicus Benedictus or Holy Thistle. Oh, okay. Um, but that that was my, that was my um, my. Uh, Capricorn herb and I think Capricorn we ought to say which body part it rules so maybe if you could talk a bit about that Ollie while I, I look well, up Capricorn is the um uh, well it's specifically the knees and more generally the bones um so um and w which is is nice because it's a big area of the bone so and, and very important um I, I, my, my much more obvious herb is going to be focusing on that but um i don't know if you've got have you found your reference yet okay Mark? yes yes i've got it no that i'm looking forward to your more obvious herb there ollie because actually uh, this the cardius or canicus is is a bit of a left field one in a way but he says um cardius benedictus or blessed thistle or holy thistle uh he says it's Ah, no, I'm telling a lie. I'm, I've got it completely wrong, actually. He says it's under the sign of Aries. <laughs> so oh, not, that not the under Yes, that makes perfect sense. So I've, so I've got that wrong. Yeah, I've been thinking it's, it's, it's all along. It's a herb of the exalted Mars, but it's actually a herb of Mars in Aries, which is where it is now. So that makes sense. And it actually um, is making me rethink it because he says it's, um, it, it's useful for dizziness and, and various other things. But I think we should move on to other plants then, because that's that's. that's I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Not, uh, well, give me. Give us your plant from. Is your plant from cool pepper or your own classification? It's from cool pepper, and it's obviously comfrey, the massive bone healer. Which um, oh, that's great. Okay, that's under. a much better one. Okay. And um, you know, um, obviously you could use it on your knees if you've got a bone problem in your knees. But it's generally a great bone healer, and um, um, and um, um you know, it, it's um, I mean, it's a it's a contentious herb now nowadays because of the um, um oh god i can never remember give, give me the word what's in it um oh don't talk the, to pyrilizidines pyrilizidine oh. i wrote my dissertation on this this is too yeah, yeah. Today. <laughs> no, um, this is how memory works sometimes ollie it's just um, like pyrilizidine yeah. alkaloids which are obviously if you have too many of them can give you um liver damage i think it's the venus uh, venus um, the, 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 they, yeah, you're right. Ven, ven, hepato, hepatic veno, veno occlusive disease or venous veno occlusive disease. Anyway, very unpleasant. And basically, when you find out about it, you're dead. So people are terrified of it. Um, that said, there's not actually that much direct evidence that a small doses like a six week course of comfrey would actually cause that. In fact, there's no evidence. I mean, it's all from extracts of pyrrolizine alkaloids being fed to rats in large quantities that any of the actual research has gone from. And a few tales of not what actually has not even been proved to be comfrey but anyway that's by the by you people can use it it's or not as they please it is very very good for bone healing um can we go out and, can i go out on a limb here i won't get prosecuted no that's there. great i mean i, mean, I certain... personally would be quite happy if someone had broken bones to give them a course of comfrey tea over a course of say six weeks while they were healing and I don't yeah, think that's I, going to I, be back. I, I agree. And I think the NIMH in the UK, the National Institute of Medical Herbalists in the UK, they've come down on that on that side of the fence yeah. as well. I think for as long as it's um, one of the standard, because there are various species that come that's through. And some of them try are... to use the um, Symphytum officinalis rather than one of the yes. Russian variants. Yeah, so don't use that. Symphytum exoplandicum or the, the, those, exactly, the Russian species, which is which higher in pyrolizidine. I think, I think they've come down on, on exactly, as you say, Oli, the, the indigenous species, the officinalis or officinale uh, species, um, 
you can use, I think they say for up to six weeks. I think it's six weeks, yeah. And yeah. the other thing is if you really want to use comfrey root, which is much stronger, you can always make it into an ointment or cream because very mm. few pyrolyzine alkaloids are absorbed through the skin. I think it's like some tiny percentage. And so obviously that would make something, particularly, for instance, a broken knee, which is quite near the surface, that would be a very good cream to make for that. Yes. Not, but there's no reason not to make it out of the leaves. But um, uh, I think this is, I think comfrey is very unfairly ignored for bone healing because of this slight like, hysteria about um, the pyrolyzine. Yeah, there. no, but it's, it's a perfect example of a satin in capricorn herb isn't it because it's, it's, it's perfect it's wonderful yeah because because it's it's a dignified satin so that's satin yes. in relatively speaking good behavior so but it's still satin it still has that kind of toxicity and saturn's enemies traditionally were sort of jupiter jupiter has this foot on the moon so you know the jupiter being the ruler of the liver as well as the lungs and, and the moon sort of absorption so so you might think that what's interesting about that that assignation of, of satin to capricorn is it strengthens the bones it's a pretty gentle herb in many respects but it still has that stealthy hidden toxicity yeah. um so yeah, great i mean it's great quite interesting that some um, cool pepper also recommends it for a lot of sort of um, um other things as well i mean which i, I won't go into but spitting of blood and respiratory of things blood like that. and fluxes and she has a belly but also, interestingly, and I think this is a slight Saturnian thing, he recommends it for moist ulcers, gangrene, mortifications and the like, which are all quite Saturnian sort of... Yes, the... yeah, sort of putrefaction of the yes. flesh, like slow death of flesh is a very Saturnine kind of uh, thing. I mean, if, it, if, it's a, if, it's a, if it's a rapid infection, that's more martial, but that, that sort of, you know, things going yeah. black and dropping off is, is a Saturnine thing, isn't it? So, yeah, that's great. I mean, the... the um, that, and you can see the satin signature in some of those rulerships with, with stopping fluxes and, you know, so healing the skin and, and, and reestablishing the integrity of the it, linings yeah. and surfaces and then stopping fluxes and, and binding. In it. But it's a, it's a relatively gentle binder. Um, so it's more, we'd, we'd now classify it as a demulsant, wouldn't we, rather yes. than yeah, it's I not an astringent. So. No, um, so, it, so it is gentle. It, it's like in, in the same way, yes. That um... yeah, it's it's a it's a relatively friendly satin herb, but it's still a satin herb. It's still <laughs> so, a satin herb. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, did you want to? Did you want? To yeah, think... I can throw in my little extra, sure. which is this. This one, I mean, this is my. This isn't from Cool Pepper. This is a herb that I'm pretty sure is is uh, Capricorn. And this is Mars in Capricorn. <laughs> not not my not my false memory syndrome uh, reassignation of 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 Knikus to Mars uh, Mars in Capricorn, which is it's Mars in Aries, which makes much more sense given the vertigo and dizziness thing. This would be coffee, coffee Ooh. Arabica, and I am pretty sure coffee is the exalted Mars. It's Mars in Capricorn. Um, it's a stimulant. It's roasted, so obviously we use the beans in their roasted form usually, so they're roasted black. It was said traditionally too much coffee increases melancholy. It actually yeah. heats you up and actually increases melancholy. <laughs> it's <clears throat> it's an active, <clears throat> excuse me, it's an active choleretic. Yes. So it increases bile output, uh, which is, you know, so I think coffee is a very martial drug, but it's also, it's it's the martial drug that fueled capitalism, I think, which yes, to me is Capricorn, is pure yes. Mars in Capricorn. It's get the work done, do the work, you know? And that's, so coffee has done that since it exploded globally. It's, it's, it's uptake by the nations of the world has paralleled the march of capitalist economies everywhere. So, yeah. And it is, and it's a bitter and bitter, bit bitter for Mars drink. And yes. it's also very deep black color for that sort of Capricorn. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's literally but... roasted. So it has that... Yeah adust collar signature you know like yeah. they're sort of like yeah absolutely absolutely love it love it okay Excellent. so Thanks. now the next one we've got to um well i certainly have drawn a complete blank on this because i cannot find any herbs that are, well certainly uh, miss culpepper puts under aquarius mm. um, me, me, me either we could we, but, but we could probably take a punt and speculate on some so well indeed indeed i mean classically um um, Aquarius rules the um, uh, the calves and the ankles, or the, and shins. That's sort of the lower leg and the ankle. Um, and 
And, and the circulation of the blood, I'd say. I was going to ask you about that, Marcus, yeah. because is that a traditional um, attribution I think, or a I think one? yes and no. It is traditional insofar as all the air signs were said to rule the blood. Right, of course. So we've got we've got the air signs Aquarius, Gemini and Libra would all rule the blood. They're all saying basically, yeah. Because they're air. Yes, yeah, exactly. They're hot and moist. I think the no bit, the, the modern bit, is because the moderns say because it's opposite Leo, which rules the uh, heart, right. you have the heart. But that makes sense to me. Schematically, it makes sense. I haven't found it... Uh, described or logic that way in traditional and symbolically it's a water carrier which is the blood flow yeah. what, rushing around the system so it's exactly so and it's so it's it's an air sign which represents the blood and it's opposite to leo and you do find these signs operate dyadically most of the yes, time so you know yeah. Ta taurus being the throat taurus being the entrance and scorpio being the exit <laughs> shall we say you one, know yeah. <laughs> taurus is where you ingest and scorpio is where you excrete and then so and and, and likewise you, you've kind of got these pairs and it's fascinating how these fall out physiologically in ways that our ancestors would not have recognized so for example like aries libra you think of libra as being the kidneys and the adrenals and aries as being the head you've got the whole hypothalamic yeah, no, no, I was just adrenal thinking axis. perfect wonderful yeah. yes yeah so so i mean so i do think i do think the modern just because it's modern doesn't mean it's wrong <laughs> no absolutely not it just always yeah. fascinates me but yeah no where, me too so I, th I think from. i think we we can be poly polymaths about this and i think as 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 um well, as herbalists and as astrologers, we should be. That's why oh, we do. Definitely, definitely. We do. So, yeah, respect so, the tradition, but don't be bound by it. Yes, as Cole Pepper said, uh, uh, something about he's, he's got various uh, pithy quotes about <laughs> tradition, <laughs> Doctor Tradition, doesn't he? He doesn't yes. have a good word to say about him. It says <laughs> people are led by the nose by tradition, as bears are led to the stake, which yes. is a, a pretty grim <laughs> Cole Pepper quote, just saying, showing what he thought about it. But anyway, <laughs> um, for anyone who doesn't get that, that's like the, in in the uh, 17th century when Culpepper was writing they would still have public entertainments with dancing bears and these would be captive bears and they'd, they'd have a ring put through their nose and they'd be tied to a stake in the public square so they'd be made to dance you know so it was kind of a his way of saying you know if you're led by the nose by tradition don't be so yeah, yeah so, exactly yeah um, um, okay so with that under our belts go for it <laughs> okay Aquarius herbs um like you, I I don't I'm not aware of any traditional assignation. I have two. Do you have any uh, possibles on the shelf at the moment? Because I have two that I can I can float. I can. I mean, shall I put my two fourth for discussion? Yes, go, go go for it. Yes, definitely. And so, so if you've got any that you you think might 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 work as well, um, the two that I've got one is uh, and this. These both of these, none of these have traditional assignation. So these are just what I'm thinking of these herbs at the moment. Centella asiatica, formerly known oh. as hydrocotyl asiatica, or go to cola, um, which is uh, a, a sort of capillary tonic. It's it's used for the improve the microcirculation and to strengthen the skin and wounds and things like that. I'm really not sure what planet I'd put it under, uh, which is which is um, potentially problematic because really one should assign a herb to a planet first and assign second <laughs> yeah um, and uh, it's interesting because i mean i would be tempted to put centella to mercury possibly as it's like a little tiny little plant oh yeah that that, that might work because, because yes I, I can see that ollie actually it's it's a it's a it's a relatively unassuming shrub i think and it's yes it is it, it's it's um I haven't seen it growing actually, so I've only seen photographs of it. So you don't really know you what a plant looks like until you yeah. see it. But um, usually, mercury things are a bit more finely divided. Correct. Yes. Um, but that would fit in terms of its uses and in terms of its, you know, because it, it strengthens all the little fine capillaries, but it also has those neurological actions yes. where it's used yep. for anxiety yep. and, yep. and cognition. And I thought maybe under Aquarius, because it's often useful for. Um, and this is just maybe a prejudice of mine, but I've often used it for sort of um, people who get purpuric uh, ankles, like varicose eczema. And that oh, sort of <laughs> that's nice. That's and, nice. And, 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 and peripheral edema, where it's not cardiac edema, but so non-cardiac 
uh, lymphedema, for example, right. responds quite right. well to centella. And obviously that will often show the lymphedema, although it can appear anyway, arms and whatever, it's, it'll often show up around the ankle. No, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Uh, just, just, a, just a possible, just floating. And my other possible one, um, a bit less mainstream perhaps, uh, I would put erythroxylum coca from which cocaine was originally extracted. <laughs> I, would, I would put that one as a herb of the moon in Aquarius, possibly. <laughs> okay. Um, and and my, my basis for that is that it's a plant that's used medicinally, mainly to treat digestive problems. So, you know, uh, an altitude sickness. So Siroche, they give it to people in Peru and Bolivia to treat right. Siroche yeah. altitude sickness. So all the symptoms that would be nausea, dizziness, uh, palpitations, stuff like that. But um, it, it's also used for diarrhea and stomach ache and, and sick stomach and headaches and things like that. And, and the sort of the, 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 the native populations there refer to the plant as mama coca. It's a sacred plant. Right. And it's, yes. it's mama coca. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, the deity, the personality they give the plant is female. So, I mean, this is a very superficial, I'd want a bit more information or, or a bit more thinking yes. than that, but I tend to think of it as a lunar plant. It has a sort of fairly unobtrusive, small white flowers. Um, it's, personified as female by the indigenous population yes. it's used for stomach ailments i think for me that's kind of enough to maybe put it in the moon ball park. i think moon that I works for me if we put it somewhere yeah yeah i don't know maybe i mean it's a stimulant but then i think tea for example camellia sinensis is often described as a herb of the moon coffee is mars chocolate yeah. is venus so just because a plant is a stimulant I mean, it doesn't, doesn't automatically make it mean, so yeah. I, th I think um the alkaloid from which it which it so if one was to do the naughty thing and extract cocaine from the plant, then that alkaloid may well have a different rulership. The alkaloid isolated, that one isolated chemical from the plant might well have a Mars rulership. So one sees this with, with um, poppies, for example, Papava somniferum, traditionally herb of the moon, opium, the narcotic residue extracted from the poppy was traditionally Saturn. So, right, yes, I so you can have that, that, that double attribute. Yeah, this, because you've this, changed the nature of it a bit. Out of the box here completely, yeah? Excellent. Could one, obviously another herb that has no attribution is ginkgo. Could we put that in Aquarius? Oh, that's an interesting one. Now, yes, maybe. I could see that because of its use as a circulatory agent. Exactly, and I'm just thinking, and it's like difficult to, I, I've often wondered, I wonder what, what you know. The, the... I, I've, I've, what planet would you assign to ginkgo? You see, I, I'm, 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 <laughs> it's very, it's a, it's a tricky one for me because on a certain level, I want to assign it to Saturn because it's prehistoric and beyond, <laughs> you know, it's a prehistoric tree from the mists of time, yes. which is a very Saturnian sort of, but yes. it doesn't really have a lot of Saturnian stuff going on. Obviously it fits no. the Aquarius beautifully, but, um, um, so I would probably put it to Venus if I had to, but I'm not quite happy oh, with that. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. I, I, I would be tempted to go, that's, uh, why Venus, Ollie? Because it's such a beautiful, uh, the, the, it's got these beautiful, um, um, I mean, you could put it in other sand, the fruit, of course, which we never see because we only ever plant um, um, male ginkgos, is absolutely revolting and stinks to high heaven, which is a very Saturnian. Yes, thing. that's not very Venusian. No. But the leaves, it's a, you know, it's, it's called... It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Lace I, 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 would be that's an inch, I would be tempted. I've always thought it's either, same as you, Saturn... Oh, really? Or Mercury. Oh, yes, that could work as well. Because, because you know that the maiden hair fern, maiden no, fern. no botanic relative, Adiantum capillus veneris, yes. just similar leaves. So ginkgo is sometimes called the maiden hair tree because the right. shape of the leaves is like the maiden hair fern, that sort of like, sort of slightly bifurcated hoof-shaped yes, yes. leaf um that that um yeah and that's mercury adiantum so and you, and you could the mercurial nature of it might but yeah i've i i am not sure so we could have a mercury and saturn for ginkgo maybe mercury and aquarius rather yeah. ginkgo, or, that would or give possibly the saturn aspect as well. but i i i'm i'm that see what saturn here we could have the fact as you say it's a prehistoric tree it's a really hardy survivor of a tree i think it was the first tree that flowered or grew up again after Hiroshima, after the bomb oh, wow, was dropped on Hiroshima, okay. the end of the Second World War, the first tree that popped up was, was a ginkgo tree. And so that 
to, to me suggests Saturn, the sort of tenacity yeah. of it and the ancientness. And, and the fact that if the fruits are stinky, that's also kind of a Saturn yeah. signature. But then, it, as you say, it's it's got quite a, an elegant, it's quite a beautiful tree. Um, so I don't know. We could have a dignified Saturn. This could be, a, but it's not very binding. It's not got. It's not toxic no, or binding exactly. or. But this would this this is this would require a little bit more thought and observation. But yeah. I, I've always plopped it in Mercury or Saturn ter- Mercury or Saturn territory. Um, you could say Mercury in Aquarius, which would then give it that bit of a Saturn cast being in a Saturn Yes, sign. so it could be Mercury in Aquarius with yeah. the Saturn overcast due to the, the sign rulership. Yeah, sure, sure. I could see that. That's an interesting one, Ollie. And that's, yeah, so G- Ginkgo is fascinating because it's um, it improves microcirculation. It's used to improve memory. Of course, memory is a Saturn. Memory, not a Saturn. So... Oh, God, yeah, it's Saturn then. Oh, come on. It's maybe, maybe. Maybe yeah. we need to. I mean, this is this is when 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 working these things out, guys. Sometimes it's flipping obvious, and sometimes it's not. And yeah. It takes a bit of work. So now that's a really good one, Ollie. I like that a lot. So okay, shall we move on to Pisces then? Excellent, excellent. Um, Pisces, as we all know, rules the feet, which look like two big fish. Hence, <laughs> I, some, uh... I, do you know, I'd never actually thought that, Ollie, but yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love it. Um, so um, that, that, that's a bit of symbolism for you. Um, I don't. What did you did? Uh, where where are you on Pisces? I mean, again, uh, Pisces. Am I right in people? Some people attribute the lymphatic system to Pisces nowadays. Correct. Yeah, a lot of the modern astrologers do, and I think they're probably right in that. I mean, it, it seems to be borne out in a lot of decumbitures and even birth charts I've seen um, where, and I, there, again, there'd be a certain logic there from a traditional point of view, because it's a water sign. So the water signs having an affinity yeah. all the fluids in the body, but you've got cancer, which is sort of like the stomach and the, the visceral organs in the middle of the body. You've got Scorpio, which is the lower abdomen and all the watery bits yeah, in there, yeah. you know, the bladder and the colon and whatnot, and the womb in, in women. But then you've got Pisces, which is the feet. What, you know, so then, I mean, but I suppose this is one where we might have to defer to reflexologists because they'll say, you know, every, every, <laughs> you can operate on everything through the feet. Um, but I, I do I do think there seems to be some... some um, some veracity in that um but traditionally obviously the lymphatic system was not a thing but they yep. would have they would have known about the, the phlegmatic humor and the movements exactly, of phlegm yes. through the body and so pisces would have been seen to have an affinity for that so i think again we can allow it <laughs> definitely so, yeah. um okay i mean and um i looking through my cover i could find one uh, which nobody okay. ever uses as it's as, uh, attributed to Pisces by Paul Pepper. Okay. And it is the Alder tree. Which oh, is, yes, uh, of course. Yes. It is a Alder tree under the dominion Pisces. of Venus and of some watery sign or others, I suppose, Pisces. And therefore, <laughs> he recommended decoction or distilled water as the leaves, which I thought, like, hmm. So, <laughs> in his wonderful way, it's like, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's not something I've ever used. I don't know. Have you ever used alder? Yeah. He, have you ever used alder, alder leaves for anything? I don't. I did actually do a monograph on them a few years ago, which is right here. I can put oh, my wow. hands on it. Oh, wow. So, exactly. Yeah. I, so so I, I did produce a little monograph on ulnus glutinosa, and I talked about it. I've never actually used it, um, but at some point I will. Because this all the tree in the garden actually. I want to rush out, get the leaves, and immediately make decoction. Well, of it's them. it's it's an interesting one because obviously traditionally you've got this. He he. I think Cole Pepper says it's cool and moist and recommends it for inflammation of the feet and uh, and and as a. But it's also I've got some other traditional uses here. Um, fresh leaf decoction as a galactagogue, so to increase okay. increase breast milk production. And paradoxically, to reduce breast engorgement in nursing mothers. So I don't know how how the, how it can do both, but okay. Uh, maybe as a sort of I'd probably think of it maybe as a topical anti-inflammatory for mastitis or something yeah, like yeah. that might might be useful. Uh, also, traditionally, cancers of the face, tongue, throat, and breast. 
Oh, right. Okay. Uh, and upper gastrointestinal tract, so esophagus, pylorus, duodenum, pancreas, and uterus. That's really interesting. And Culpepper described it as a plant of Venus in Pisces. Um, uh, this would mean he classified it as a medicine that counters inflammation and has affinity for the throat, breast, womb, and kidneys, and in modern terms, possibly the pancreas, benefits the feet and is cold and moist in nature. Yeah. Uh, and then recommends it as a leaf decoction against burns and skin inflammation, a fresh leaf poultice to dissolve swellings, um, and placing fresh leaves in shoes to alleviate walkers' sore feet. Which is like, yes. <laughs> something I really want to try. I want to try now. too, yeah. <laughs> So, um, but then scientific data... It does have these really interesting compounds called diaryl heptanoids in wow. it. And one of the compounds in it, hirsutinone, has a similar chemical structure to curcumin from turmeric, believe it or not, wow. in the leaves. So, I mean, obviously it's not bright yellow, so no. it doesn't do the stainy thing. It shares to curcumin cytotoxic effects on prostate, cervical, and colorectal cancer cells in vitro, um, most of the diarrheal heptanoids isolated from the bark found to protect against pro chromosome and DNA damage in human lymphocytes, um, neutralized free radicals, and inhibited the toxicity of cisplatin and doxorubis into normal cells while still allowing a considerable anti cancer effect. So, in other words, in the lab, there's some compounds in uh, alder leaf which show real promise potentially uh, yeah. in, in the sort of um, interesting complementary treatment should we say of, of of cancers so so used alongside chemotherapy which you've got to be careful about obviously yeah, absolutely, yeah. as herbalists we know because you can you don't want to give a plant and neutralize uh the beneficial effect or increase the toxicity of any chemotherapy which is you know the worst case scenario but there's some really interesting um uh, uh stuff there so yeah so that's that's alder um, so and the fact that it's given Venus in Pisces, the exalted Venus, exalted, yes. suggests that perhaps we may may want to be paying a bit more attention to the tree than we have been, yes, medicinally speaking. Oh, okay. Well, I, I will. I'll go and have a look at some older leaves. Thank you for having yeah. a <laughs> I'll, I'll send you that, Ollie. I, I mean, it's, oh, it's still on the really nice, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I send you. It just it's what, what when I when I went through a craze of doing mini monographs a few years ago, I, I produced one on it. So. Um, so any any um uh, 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 you know non pepper Pisces yes though? yeah no I, I I do have one now cool pepper mentions it but he just assigns it a planet and I think I would put it in Pisces and that is the sweet violet Viola okay. odorata yeah um now I may be wrong about this I mean cool pepper does say it's vi it's Venus which sweet violet obviously is. I think I put it in Pisces for really, if I think about it, for two reasons. And mm -hmm. one of them is sort of more poetical and the other one's more seasonal. <laughs> the seasonal <laughs> reason is that violets tend to flower February, oh, March, yes, yes, when yes. Venus is often in Pisces anyway yep, in the yep, Northern yep. Hemisphere. And, uh, so, and the second, the poetical reason is really the evanescence of the scent of violets. They are so... You know, the, the smell literally is, um, I can't remember the name of the compound that gives violet its violety smell, but mm -hmm. it has this particular property where it very rapidly saturates the olfactory receptor. So you can only get it by wafting. I mean, this is true of like perfumiers and stuff do tend to, they set, tell you not to stick a scent under your nose and go, you know, they, they right, tend to yeah, yeah. advise that you yeah. walk a scent by so that you, because you don't want to desensitize your nose to it. But with violets particularly, they very, the, the chemical, if you look this up, they'll tell you about it on Wikipedia, I'm sure, or other places with more scientific respectability. But you can, you can that, that smell very quickly saturates the, the, the olfactory receptors so that you can only detect it very passing, very fleetingly. And there's something about that that seems to speak to me about the the nature of Venus in her exaltation. It's yes, like this amazing, yes. delicate, yeah. wonderful smell that can only be experienced like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't know. I'll take it away. I don't know. I don't know. That's the part I say. It's poetical. It's not very. Uh, no, no, no. I like that. I like that. Very hard. But I mean, the, the the tradition. I guess violets were cooling. They were cool and moist. 
Um, again, in modern terms, we'd recommend viola odorata as a lymphatic. Um, yeah. it, you know, it was used to cool fevers. Um, so, and so, yeah, I, I, I would put it as a Venus in Pisces plant. Like it, like it. Maybe? Okay, we've completed. Anyway. We've gone round the circle back at Aries. <laughs> we have, haven't we? So we'll have to think about something new to talk about next time. We will. Um, Any anyone who has any suggestions, please put them in the comments. Otherwise, yes, do. We'll so, so if there's, and I think. I think from our from a, we had a, a question from uh, one of our listeners, Lucy, uh, a while back. So we could bring that up next time. I think about maybe talking about the different kinds of astrology, um, mm -hmm. and and th so this was a question. So is in like the difference between psychological astrology oh, and okay. uh, sort of mo modern astrology. So she was saying as a as a total newbie to astrology, okay. it would okay. be quite. So I thought that might be one topic. I think that, that, might, that might be fun. That might yes. be fun. In, yeah, but, but guys, anything you want us to talk about, herbal, astrological, combination of the two, either or, please let us know in the comments. Uh, and if you've enjoyed our ramblings today, please do like this podcast. Please subscribe to us, share it, do all the things. Um, and hopefully we'll see you next time.